much everyone for joining us. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, this mic is really annoying, so we're just gonna try to talk really loudly. Uh, welcome to the first beta and brews since the pandemic, I think. We've had everything else on Zoom, virtual, yeah. So thanks for coming to a per an event in person. Um, I know that that's not the norm anymore. So very glad to have all of you here um, and super glad to have Kyle here as our first speaker for the first time in person since like 2019. Um, Kyle probably doesn't need in the introduction. He's better known as Climber Kyle, and he had, if you can do it on legs or skis or with ice tools or climbing, he's done quite a lot of it in Washington and beyond. So we're super excited to have him here to share um, some of his experiences with fast and light traverses in the Alpine Lakes wilderness. Um, he's got a lot of beautiful photos to share with us um, and talk us through some of his uh, traverses. Um, afterwards, uh, we're going to ask more questions. We'll have time for Q&A um, and then also time to just chat, grab another beer, um, find some climbing partners to maybe tackle one of these traverses. Um, so yeah, any, any questions before we get started? Everyone know how to listen to a presentation and save their questions for after? Great. Okay, perfect. Um, don't be shy about grabbing another beer uh, and take it away, Kyle. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming. This is the first time I've ever like given a presentation to people, so it's exciting. Um, today I'm going to talk about a few specific traverses I've done in the Alpine Lakes Wilderness. Uh, to start things off, we're going to do a little bit of like guess that place. Um, and one rule is if you are in the photo, you guys, <laughs> you cannot, you cannot participate. All right, gotta let other people. Okay, so where do you guys think this is? Shout it out. Yep, there we go. There, there we go. go. Cool. Yeah, basically. Enchantments. Big Chihuahua. Rio skied it. Yep. Big, that was Big Chihuahua. Iconic Lake. No. Lake. Plus. That is Jade Lake and the Dip Top Glacier. This one's pretty generic looking, I have to admit. Okay, chain lakes. These are all Alpine Lakes wilderness. Anybody got a guess? Similar, but this is Alpine Lakes wilderness. This is uh, Kashmir, not Kashmir. Yep, like Ida. Come on, skiers got to get this one. Yep, it's locked the back. No, but kind of similar area. It's like similar, similar area. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anybody got a guess here? Similar area. What? Yep, Daniel's got it. What? Uh, yeah, Lima, very close. Yeah. Okay, this is the Louvre. Picture of Logan skiing. Any guesses here? Yep. 
This is the, the rampart legs. Area. Any guesses? I heard an ingalls. Yep. Any guesses here? Close. Kendall. Yep, Kendall. Any guesses? Hmm? It's Red Rock. It's Serpent tonight. But Logan, you got to guess where it is? How do you go easy? So the Chihuahua range. This one should be familiar. Yep, Snoqualmie Mountain. And Daniel's got it, Mount Daniel. Okay, so before I talk about the traverses, uh, I'll give a background of how I got into all this and, and everything. So uh, these are some baby pictures of me at the Denny Creek water slide. I was born and raised in Briar, Washington. If you know where Briar, Washington is, you probably have either got a speeding ticket there or you got lost there. So Briar is a tiny, tiny suburb kind of between at the north end of Lake Washington, between like Kenmore and Bothell and Linwood. It's like beneath between I-5 and 405 and 522. It's kind of right there in the middle. So yeah, I was born there, uh, grew up there, went to school there. A lot of my friends from the area are here. Uh, there's some other funny pictures. This is like, you know, like uh, Stranger Things, like 11. It's like... <laughs> Me doing it, channeling my the apparently a very early climber Kyle. I actually had never seen this picture until a few days ago and asked my parents for baby pictures. This is uh, me at the Fremont lookout. That was like one of the first hikes I ever actually like hiked out of the backpack and didn't get carried by my dad. Um, yeah, so growing up, I was really into cross country. Uh, this like bottom right picture is the Great Pumpkin Run, which is like an elementary cross country event. And I got third place in the district. So I got a pumpkin. It was always exciting. Um, I ran in high school for Inglemore. Uh, my one of my high school coaches, Scott, uh, Rich Bennett is here. Rich. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, so cross country was just like a really, really big part of my life in high school. Um, I was a captain. I was three-year varsity, but at the back end of varsity. And I just love the community. I love the people. I love the people on the team. I love the culture around it, um, both how it's like an individual sport, but also a collective sport. So, you know, it's like you're working together to, to be better, but ultimately in the end, you also have to like rely on yourself. Once I got like a driver's license, um, we started doing like I started going on hikes with my friends in the summer um, or even actually the winter. This photo here on the summit of Mount Sai um, was a winter hike. And yeah, Blake and Grant were there. I remember we did both Sai and then we did cable line after. And that was like crazy, like two hikes in one day. We were dying of cable line. I remember that. But that was that was fun. Uh, so we started doing more hikes. And yeah, originally, initially it was like, you know, Mount Sai, Mount Dickerman, Granite Mountain, stuff like that. But then um, we gradually started to get into more, more scrambling. You know, I remember Mount Pew was like the biggest hike we ever did. We were like wanting to do that all summer, the uh, summer after senior year of high school. And then we got it done near the end of the summer. That was sweet. So I went to college at Gonzaga University in Spokane. Um, but kind of just kept getting more and more into these mountain sports. Uh, the picture in the upper left is uh, winter camping, like snowshoeing up in North Cascades. Um, that's like El Dorado Peak in the upper right. 
And you can see back then I was definitely not fast and light. I was slow and heavy. So I had like a five pound synthetic sleeping bag strapped to the side. That bottom thing is a sleeping pad. Um, and it was like all my dad's like 30, 40 year old backpacking gear. Um, I, I didn't actually go backpacking until around the end of high school. So, you know, it was still new to me. Uh, started learning to get how to get into mountaineering. So the summer uh, after my freshman year of college, uh, my friend Daniel, who's in the audience, pitched this idea of the 12 peak challenge of like doing 12 cascade volcanoes. And we had never been on a glacier at this point. Um, I didn't end up going with them on the whole trip. I just did a few of the volcanoes with them um, because I had an internship, but uh, I did Rainier and Abs with them. This is us on the summit of Rainier. So, you know, Daniel like pitches us this idea and we just literally like got out Freedom of the Hills. We like went on his roof and we started like lowering buckets of water and building like like three to one pulleys and like, you know, like lifting them up and stuff like that. Or we like would hang ourselves off and press stick up trees and stuff like that. So uh, it was really fun to, I guess, learn stuff on our own and be like really self-taught, really self-reliant, because then it wasn't it was never a question of like, how do you do this? we can't do this. We need to find someone to like show us how to do this. It was like, well, we can learn, we can figure out how to do this. We'll do this together, you know? Um, so I think that that was like a really fun aspect of a partnership with all, with all these guys that um, really I've, I've known some of them since I was like very little. Uh, picture at the bottom left was also that same summer that I climbed Mount Rainier, but a totally different thing. I had never hiked more than 14 miles in a day. And then I told Blake here and one other guy, Ethan, he was actually just a sophomore in high school at the time. I was like, we should go run chicken man in a day. Cause I saw on summit posts that they were saying like to do like chicken man, usually you come in from mineral park, but it's a long day. Only like crazy people would do it from Snoqualmie pass in a day. So I was like, we're going to do it from Snoqualmie pass. And it was about 30 miles. And I like bonked so hard on the way back, like barely could walk, you know, it, it destroyed me, but it was also just like really cool to see how much ground we could cover in a day um, if we just kind of like, you know, took it mile by mile. So I was kind of like developing, you know, like mountaineering and also like trail running separately. And then it was fun a few summers later to put that together when Daniel and I did Glacier Peak in a day. Uh, that was two summers later. And that was that was like a huge that was a huge day. It was a dream come true. There are also some weird moments. Uh, checks in the background. So as I was getting into mountaineering, you know, I was trying to really diversify all my skills. And the cool thing is about like the group of guys that I got into the mountains with is we each had our niches, you know, like Blake and I were more the trail runners from cross country. Um, Daniel bought a trad rack, like a few hexes and stuff. And I was like, oh crap, like I need to learn how to trad climb too. You know, so this is like me climbing Liberty Bell for the first time. That was my first Alpine trad route. Um, that was a picture by Daniel. And then my friend Logan's been a lifelong skier and uh, he kind of pushed this like skiing thing. And so when my junior year of college, I learned how to downhill ski um, and then senior year started backcountry skiing. Spokane was a really great place for that because the resorts are a lot less crowded than around here. And they were like, you could do like $15 night skiing in Mount Spokane and stuff. So, you know, just kind of building all these different skills. I graduated from Gonzaga uh, in the spring of 20, uh, 2018. I was a computer engineer, hence this uh, class of 2018, but in binary. You know, uh, also I had a minor in entrepreneurial leadership and almost a minor in jazz. Um, so that's what all the music stuff is about. Uh, oh yeah. So after graduating, uh, I didn't start working until about September of that fall. And, uh, my partner at the time and I took a two month road trip, um, around, around the West to live that hashtag van life. So here is our beautiful van. It's actually, uh, my parents' minivan and I built a little platform, put gear in, and we put a little foam mattress on top of it. Uh, and that was our, that was our sick van traveling around the West.
we went all over the place. Um, spent a lot of time in the High Sierra in California. Um, we climbed in the Wind River Range. We also skied Gannett Peak, which was a terrible, terrible idea for people new to backcountry skiing. Just imagine like days and days of flat skinning. Would not recommend it. Um, we, you know, climbed the Grand, and my partner broke her foot. No, sort of repelling with broken foot. Uh, we. Like, we, yeah, we went all over Wyoming, Idaho, California, um, climbed in Yosemite, climbed in the Wind River Range. It was an amazing two months. But the really the highlight of those two months was a two week trip called the Sierra High Route that we did. The Sierra High Route is a mostly off trail kind of non technical backpacking route that goes north to south or south to north through most of the High Sierra. Um, it's about 200 miles long, and it, uh, it was made popular by um, John Roper uh, of the 50 Classic Climbs, so the same guy. And we actually did most of the standard Sierra High Route and combined it with kind of a southern Sierra High Route all the way to Mount Whitney to make this 240-mile behemoth. Uh, it, you know, we were traveling between 10 and 12 or 13,000 feet the whole time, a lot of boulder hopping, a lot of talus, um, and a lot of just beautiful meadows. And yeah, so here's some pictures. We got like Humphreys Basin, Upper Mills Lake, the Ritter Range, uh, Bear, the, like the Bear Lakes Basin, um, just so many incredible, beautiful spots. We also had some just utterly awful moments. Like we got basically monsooned on almost every afternoon. Um, if you've never heard of the Southwest monsoon, it's pretty nasty. We got like inches of hail while crossing 12,500 foot passes. There'd be lightning going off. We'd hear rock fall from the lightning and huddling caves and stuff. Uh, it was it was pretty nasty at times. But then after the storms passed, we had moments like this that were just so beautiful and so moving. At the end of two weeks, we summited Mount Whitney. This is on the summit at like 4 a.m. Um, finishing our grand adventure, the Sierra High Route. It was really taxing. I lost like 10 or 15 pounds just because I couldn't get enough food the whole time. We were exhausted, but it was also a life changing experience. I had never done something like that in the mountains where it was so continuously beautiful and challenging. I had always thought of mountains and like objectives as more like a single thing. Like, say you're approaching a trail to climb to the summit of a peak and back. But with the Sierra High Route, like you don't really summit any peaks. You're not trying to climb a specific route. You're not trying to ski a line. It's about creating an experience, like an experience that's like very beautiful, really connects you with the land, and it's very personal. So that changed my perspective about how I plan trips in the mountains and the kind of things I wanted to do. So when I came um, back after that summer, I started working here. I was living in uh, the Seattle area uh, and, you know, started adventuring, and started exploring. But I knew I really wanted to bring that vision of the Sierra High Route to the Cascades. I, I knew that it wasn't as common to do that kind of stuff. But I knew that was possible. So here's a picture of Logan doing some ice skating out in the fall near, it's kind of near Gem Lake area, um, but notice the big towering peaks of the Alpine Lakes Crest back there. And we just kind of ended up spending a lot of that winter, you know, in the Snoqualmie backcountry, ice is uh, topping out on Chair Peak, Northeast Buttress, classic ice climb, um, but always looking at those distant peaks of the Alpine Lakes Crest, that, that high crest of Overcoat, Chimney Rock, and the Limas and Chickamen. And you can see that, that gap between Overcoat and Chimney Rock kind of forms that U. And it felt like kind of like this gateway or this portal, like what lies beyond that? And it was really motivating. It was really inspiring to be doing all these like close to the road adventures, but like always seeing those peaks out there and wondering what was out there. It was really like a curiosity. So that gets me to the first traverse I'm gonna talk about, which is the Alpine Lakes Crest Traverse. So I did that almost exactly four years ago, pretty much four years ago this week uh, with me and Logan, who's back there. 
33 miles in 14,400 feet game over two days. Um, this was a route that was really inspired by those days in the Snoqualmie backcountry, like looking at those peaks, finding something that inspired us, and then pulling out a map and figuring out how we could string together an aesthetic, challenging route that would really capture the beauty of that area, you know, traveling over high glaciers, going past beautiful lakes like this. Um, yeah, so that's that's what inspired the Alpine Lakes Crest Traverse. So we did a two day route. Uh, well, it was a two day plan. So we had lightweight backpacking gear and we felt pretty confident that we could complete this route in two days. We didn't know, you know, whether it'd be like a hard two days or an easier two days. Um, we started by leaving a car up at the Cathedral Pass Trailhead, which is for Mount Daniel, and then drove back to Snoqualmie Pass. And most of the first section was just hiking the PCT here. Uh, around Chickamin, we went off trail. You can see um, up that kind of southwest facing slope near the shoulder of Chickamin. So here's Logan climbing some kind of steeper grass. And then on the back side of Chickamin, you really enter like a wild, remote feeling Alpine Lakes wilderness with tarns and you know, you're away from any site of the highway and there's big towering peaks. So here's some walking down the backside in the snow. The next section is really, really where it gets good. So in planning the route, you know, you can see like Chimney Rock and Lima form really what I, I consider the, the Alpine Lakes Crest. It's this ridge of high serrated 7,000 foot peaks, very technical to get around. And there's all these cliffs like, you know, how could you make your way through it? Definitely the, the obvious path is going by Iceberg Lake and then up to the Overcoat Glacier. So that was our plan. Now I knew that people kind of went to Iceberg Lake sometimes from Chickamin Lake, um, but I wasn't sure about getting up to the Overcoat Glacier. It seemed like it would seemed like it would work out and that was part of the adventure for us to figure that out. So here's a picture of Logan at uh, Iceberg Lake. Um, we had come down kind of the snow on the left side of that picture and then past the half melted lake. This is a Beautiful, beautiful rock. If you ever do this route, you will see that rock and you will exactly know where it is because it's like this 30 foot boulder sticking out of a pile of choss. Very nice. Um, and then we climbed up towards Overcoat Glacier. There's some real interesting like there's like water draining from the Overcoat Glacier to the south, uh, forming these waterfalls. You have to scramble these really bomber ledges kind of through the waterfalls, which mm -hmm. was an interesting challenge, a little bit engaging, but, you know, pretty fun third class scrambling. The Overcoat Glacier is a pretty impressive feature for the Alpine Lakes Wilderness for the fact it's in King County. It's this high plateau of ice, still pretty big, even though it's receded a lot. And it actually uh, drains and flows into both eastern Washington and western Washington. So like half of it or so flows to the east towards San Luis and then a good amount of it flows to the north into the middle fork of the Snoqualmie. So that's part of why the middle fork Snoqualmie maybe has a little more turquoise tilt, uh, turquoise uh, kind of color than the South Fork because it's glacially fed by some glaciers like the Overcoat Glacier. So this bottom photo is Logan crossing the Overcoat Glacier and just this, this beautiful like plateau of ice in the sky with views all around the Cascades. Um, the next section was this little traverse over to the saddle just west of Summit Chief. And we thought this might be the crux of the entire route. We didn't really know how it would go. Um, couldn't really find trip reports of doing it. There was a lot of up and down kind of crossing snow fingers. And then there was in the bottom right here, you see these kind of sloping ledges. So this was the key ledge. Um, and it's like cliffs below, cliffs above, but it's like a second class ledge. And when we got through it, and it felt like kind of unlocking the entire high route. We knew it would be good. Then the next picture in the upper right is descending beneath um, the north face of the summit chief into this beautiful post glacial valley with. Um, you know, beautiful gravel bars and giant house-sized boulders towering. And it's just like a magical area. And then we made camp. We hit a trail briefly uh, and camped at Williams Lake, which is in the upper right. Second day, we went over Hinman towards Mount Daniel. So from Williams Lake, we took kind of the trail up towards the Chain Lakes and then up towards Lebon Gap. Mount Hinman is a very high, low angle, uh, used to be heavily glaciated uh, kind of granitic peak in the central Alpine Lakes wilderness. 
it really that's the place where it starts to feel like you're at the rooftop of the Cascades. You know, you can see all the way to Baker, Glacier Peak, um, you know, other Glacier Peak wilderness peaks, enchantments like, you know, it's you're just on this like beautiful high plateau with some um, glaciers and grant like granite talus and granite slabs. Himmen was actually considered to for a ski area back in like the 60s and 70s because of these beautiful, you know, high elevation, low angle north facing slopes. So we went over Hinman and then enjoyed excellent kind of boot skiing and jogging down the remnants of the upper Foss Glacier, um, down past some really, really pretty tarns and headed over down into the valley of the lower Foss Glacier. The final part of the route, we got up to Pea Soup Lake by climbing these beautiful granite slabs next to a raging waterfall, the outlet of Pea Soup Lake. That's definitely one of my favorite parts of the route because you feel just like so remote for the Alpine Lakes when it's so wild and there's just all this, the power, you can feel the power of the water, the glacially polished slabs um, in this giant valley coming down from Pea Soup Lake. So once at Pea Soup Lake, um, getting to the summit of Mount Daniel, that was definitely one of the one of the concerns we had. Um, the Lynch Glacier, like, has a pretty steep ice fall where it pours into Pea Soup Lake, um, and we didn't think that that would be like a viable option, uh, especially like in the summertime season. People ski it in the spring, but it's not something that you really want to be on in the summer because it's steep and icy, and there's like rock slabs, and you're above cliffs above the lake. So what I noticed is that there was this kind of uh, ramp to the uh, west of the lake where we could go up more like granite slabs and snow fingers and gain the upper part of the glacier from there. And so that got us definitely past like the most hazardous and technical section of the glacier. Um, now, like the Lynch Glacier was definitely the, the only glacier we were really concerned about traveling on. You notice like we didn't use a rope. Uh, that's something that is a, is a rather a personal decision. There's definitely risk in traveling on glaciers on Broke. We do our best when we make these kind of decisions to look at like late season satellite imagery. Now we have LIDAR in a lot of glaciers and you kind of can tell generally where cracks form, um, but you do have to, it did take a lot of years of experience to like feel comfortable doing something like that. And I still don't take it lightly whenever I travel on a crevasse glacier um, without a rope. And I'll, I'll really think about it before we make any decisions like that. So we went up the upper Lynch Glacier. You could see some storm clouds brewing. And then we finally reached the summit of Mount Daniel, which is a short scramble once you get off the Lynch Glacier. So this is me like kind of looking back on the traverse. Um, I mean, Suquamish Pass is like basically out of view even of these high peaks, it's beyond them all. And in just you know one and a half days, we had covered all that high, incredible, beautiful terrain. So that was a really cool moment, reaching the summit, realizing that this like vision, this route that I had just drawn up, not only did it work, not only did it go, it was also like this beautiful experience. And it was the kind of experience that I was looking for, that I was trying to create um, in the Alpine Lakes wilderness. It captured, you know, both the beautiful valleys, the lakes, and the high peaks, and really kind of the rugged, remote nature within what is typically considered a high-use wilderness area. Then we just took the standard Mount Daniel Trail out to Cathedral Pass. Um, two years later, Nick Danielson, who is a, a local like filmmaker, creator, he's actually doing a ton of work for Killian Jornet and the N Normal brand now. He approached me actually and asked me if I would be interested in doing the Traverse again. And he wanted to make a short film about it for the Trail Running Film Festival. He never got around to actually making that film, but we did do the Traverse together uh, in one day. So this time around, uh, it was July 25th, 2021. It was me, Logan again, Daniel, and then an all-star crew of Nick Danielson, Jenny Abegg, who you might know for doing the North Cascades high route with Caitlin Gerben last summer. It's an epic route from Canada all the way to uh, kind of the gun site, southern end of the Tarmigan Traverse. And then Tara Fraga, who's a really, really excellent trail runner. So the six of us did the Alpine Lakes Crest. And this, this photo from Nick, 
at sunset beautifully shows that the crest that we traverse. Here's us at Kendall Catwalk in the early morning, right at around sunrise. Here's Jenny with uh, Overcoat Coal in the background. So it's running down the Overcoat Glacier. It was a little bit later season that year, so you can see there's a little bit of bare ice kind of coming into view. Uh, this is the, I was just kind of taking a shower. It was like kind of hot that afternoon. So this is like in the Hinman area. This photo was made famous by my famous book, Kate Green for the Weekend Warrior. If you haven't seen it, uh, on my blog, I have um, a book preview. Some people, some famous athletes like Caitlin Gerben and Jenny Begg wrote book reviews for me about my book, and you can purchase it. Uh, if you have any copies, I'll sign it after the presentation. Anyways, yeah, uh, this crossing the outlet of Peace Soup Lake, uh, ascending up the upper Lynch Glacier. Um, this is just one of my favorite views in the world. Looking down the Lynch with Glacier Peak framed. You can see Baker in the upper left. You can see the outline of Sloan Peak. You can see the NTAP peaks to the right. I mean, it really just feels like you're on the rooftop of the Cascades. It's so beautiful up there. This is Tara on the summit. Yeah, so the uh, that's the Alpine Lakes Crest Traverse. If you guys are interested in doing it, um, there's beta on my website with some maps. Uh, there's two trip reports. The first one has a little more details about the routes because that was the first time we did it. And if you're thinking about timing, now is the time. Like um, Logan and I were just up on the Overcoat Glacier last week. That was a little earlier than we had been the other, other times. But, you know, generally the early to midsummer time period is is the right time. You want the PCT to be snow free to check them in so that like the trail's easy. But then you want really as much snow cover as possible because all those north facing descents are really nice and pleasant with snow. But if you try to do them late season, probably going to be a lot of annoying boulder hopping, some loose choss. The glaciers might be more opened up and stuff. So, um, yeah, got a beautiful weekend coming up. Could be could be a fun route, however many days you do it over. The next time I'm going to talk about the Snoqualmie Outroute, which is a ski traverse that I did with some friends uh, in late May of 2021. The Snoqualmie Outroute is a term used to describe general high ski traverses in the Alpine Lakes Crest region from Snoqualmie Pass. Uh, Martin Volkin, who is the owner of Pro Ski and North Bend, and also the guidebook author for um, the most popular ski guidebook, he's from Switzerland. And he kind of saw there's the out route in Switzerland goes from uh, Chamonix to Zermatt, two like iconic mountain towns. This is high ski route. And so for him, he had that vision of that experience. He wanted to bring that kind of to Washington, to Snoqualmie Pass. So it was cool to see how like that story for him is kind of like similar to me with the Sierra High route, wanting to bring that to the Cascade. So it shows that like cool creations come when you like, you're inspired by something and you try to like take a vision or take a process and bring that to like a new environment or someplace that's like important to you. So Swan so Kwame Outreach is just kind of like a general term. What we did was kind of more a, uh, it's not like the specific route prescribed by Vulcan, but it's in the spirit of going from some Kwame Pass to Ski Traverse into kind of the Hinman Daniel region. So I did this with uh, Anthony Mara, Will Jones, and two guys from the Wasatch, Nick Pearson and Adam Bellamy, and it was 31 miles with 13,300 feet of gain. But that's not the whole story. So we uh, did this in late May on what was a really big, deep snowpack for Snoqualmie Pass. And that was really crucial because we wanted to be able to do this traverse like when the spring snowpack was really mature, meaning it had consolidated a lot, you know, avalanche danger was really minimal. Uh, the snow would be corn most of the day, but we still needed snow coverage like at Snoqualmie Pass because we were going to be starting up the Commonwealth Basin, which is like common winter ski touring. So a deep snowpack was was really what we were looking for, and it felt like the right year to do something out there. Um, we started around 4 a.m. And I just remember like walking under I-90 with our skis and these other guys don't really know Snoqualmie Pass that well, especially the ones from Utah. They had no idea what we we're getting into. And 
there's like you know all the black asphalt on the snow it's nasty there's like trucks going over over us a trucker came by and he like saw us with the skis and he's like you guys must be some motivated recreators i like it <laughs> and so we joked for the rest of the day we weren't like skiers we we're motivated recreators so we started skinning up through the dark in the commonwealth basin and we got to the kendall catwalk at sunrise here's uh will um booting through some steep snow crossing the kendall catwalk uh, we took a different route than the PCT, kind of going a little bit on the west side of the crest, um, because the PCT is more of a hiker's trail. And, and if you see, like, following that that line of the PCT would be, like, a lot of steep side hilling, which is not contrary to popular belief. I don't actually seek out steep side hilling. I know a lot of people I'm known for that, but um, this is ski traverse. We're trying to ski fall line. So by going kind of to near Thompson and stuff, what you'll notice is that we're like climbing up like west slopes and skiing east slopes. That's what you want to do early on a day on a ski traverse because northeast slopes get light first. So even though it was 7 a.m. on that descent near Thompson, we were skiing corn. Um, we shot across this frozen lake out there, climbed up to the next saddle and started headed over towards Huckleberry. As I was skinning, one of the guys was like, Kyle, I think something's weird with your binding." And we looked at it and the binding, uh, the toe piece was peeling, the top sheet was like peeling from the base of the ski. So you could see like space between my top sheet and my base. So that's really not good because like your heel piece, your toe piece is more important than your heel piece, right? Like you could always get through like just with like free healing, like telemark, you know, back in the day, uh, but you kind of need the toe piece. So that was concerning. We were like a third of the way through the traverse and there was the potential to shorten it if I had issues and was like, man, I really want to keep going and go with these guys. Uh, hopefully maybe we can just like bandage it up and keep going. So we put a bunch of ski straps around that area. We put the ski cramp on to try to like decrease the, the pressure uh, or the torque. And, you know, we kept skinning. Um, Actually, the next few descents, because they're icy, I didn't even ski down. I just booted down, uh, which was pretty exhausting. I was like trying to run and like catch up with the other guys that were skiing. Um, but, you know, I, I really wanted to keep going with them. So here's the next section. Um, so after descending the north side of Huckleberry, we kind of traversed around the west side of Chickamin. So that's a bit different than the Alchemix higher. But then we did join it on that dis Alpamix crest first. Then we did join it on the descent to Iceberg Lake. And I did actually ski some of this because these are like long downhill traverses where it's really, really efficient to have skis. But then because of the other ski and like the bandages I had on it, I crashed in like breakable crust and I broke the other ski on the tip. So now this other one, like the binding's fine, but like the tip was floppy. So now I had two broken skis and I was like halfway through and I was like, okay, well, I guess we're going to keep going. <laughs> like, this, this, this stuff is pretty committing, you know, it's uh, not easy to get out. Uh, yeah, so we, we climbed up to the Overcoat Glacier. Uh, the climb was very simple this time of year, all snow. We got to the Overcoat Glacier and we skied down the Overcoat Glacier. So you remember the Alpine Lakes Crest Traverse kind of does a traverse over towards Summit Chief. With skiing, you know, again, those type of like up and down traverses are really annoying. So instead, we skied fall line all the way to the valley floor through the old like overcoat glacier moraine and stuff. Um, and that was just beautiful, beautiful ski terrain. It was gentle, low angle, north facing corn. You can see those turns with Chimney Rock in the background. But I think you can also, do you see how there's one set of tracks that like cuts way back to everyone's track? That was me. I was just like trying to make the fewest number of turns possible to like put the least amount of stress on my skis. So like it literally looked like a skin trap, like through everyone's beautiful turns. It was kind of sad. Someday I'll have to go back and actually ski the overcoat glacier. Yeah. Um, so at that point I was actually skiing because I knew I only had like two more descents left and I was like, okay, well screw it. I'll just like ski really softly. Um, so we skied all the way down to the Middle Fork Valley where there was tons of snow. Again, that's why it's important to have a good Snoqualmie snowpack for this down at 4K. And then we were like skiing um, up towards Williams Lake. So 
after some beautiful skinning through old growth trees, we started climbing up towards the Long Gap again. And we knew the weather was going to go downhill. We only really had kind of a half day weather window. So clouds started forming. Um, as we were climbing up hidden in, it like actually started raining some. Um, and the viz was terrible. Uh, in addition to the two broken skis, my, also my heel piece wasn't rotating anymore. So uh, I was stuck in like high heel riser mode, which kind of sucked. I, I really don't like heel risers. For those of you who know me, I like never use them, but I was stuck using heel risers. It was like everything was coming after me, it felt like. So we went almost to the summit of Himen and we went to the, to the high ridge. And then we skied down kind of bad snow at this point because it was like raining. Uh, down the Hinman Glacier, um, down to a big, you know, flat, frozen lake. Um, this was the only descent that was like, or up until that point, like the skiing had actually been good, but this one was not very good. And then it was kind of interesting, like how how are we going to get out? So a lot of people when they do some call me out route, like they exit out from Mount Daniel, but at this time of year you can't drive to the Mount Daniel Trailhead, so you'd need a snowmobile to come pick you up, or more specifically, we would need like five snowmobiles to come pick us up. So that was like, you know, probably not going to happen. Um, so our better option was to go out the, the East Fork Foss Trail to US2. Plus, then we could say we ski from I-90 to US2 in a day, which sounds cool and looks cool on Strava map. So, you know, that was like the easy decision. But how do we get down to that valley? I kind of just, I didn't honestly do much planning for this. And we, you can see we crossed that ridge uh, north of Lake Lisuit. And that descent was not the best choice. Um, you can see this picture in the upper right. It's a man basically like, I don't know, veggie belaying with skis on his back down through boulders and alder. The skiing went fine for a while. We actually pulled off like navigating through a bunch of like sketchy cliff bands. And by this point, I was like jump turning in my skis and like my toe piece was lifting every time. But this was the final descent on those skis. So I was like, screw it. I'm going to ski out. Um, we got down to the valley and then we had to cross uh, the river, which luckily we found this like nice big old growth tree, um, but everything was wet and we were just like trying to get out at that point. I just love that picture of Nick. I mean, he's he's just like, what the hell did I get myself into? It was like, like he like skis like primo blower Wasatch Pow every day in Utah. And then he comes to like the PNW and does this shit like, yeah. <laughs> but we made it across the river, we hit dry trail, and we slogged out the next five miles of trail. And uh, Adam's wife actually was, was waiting for us there to pick us up with uh, tons of food. So we were very thankful, um, but it was it was a long day. I think it was like 18 hours or something. Yeah. So yeah, that's the simple on the out route. Um, it was a really fun ski traverse. I think that you definitely want a year with like a, a pretty deep snowpack it's falling past so you can really give it time to mature um the, the problem with a thinner snowpack is then you have to go earlier in the season say april or something and as skiers may know earlier in the spring like corn windows are very small and there's still wet slide dangers and all these stuff and when you're doing a big ski traverse there's a lot more considerations than a high route right a summer high route it's like you just need to be able to get through all the terrain and skiing it's like I need to get to this point at this time or else this slope will become unstable due to the sun. So there's just a lot you have to like think about. Is this slope going to be firm? Is this slope going to be soft when we get there? Um, so ski traverses definitely are another level, um, but you can also cover so much different terrain and you can have so much fun. And you, it's, it's just a different way of um, experiencing the mountains, but I definitely plan them differently. Here's uh, my personal Strava heat map of the Alpine Lakes Wilderness. I just thought it was kind of cool to show just like how much potential there is for adventure here. You know, I've just scratched the surface. There's still so much more, but it's already like this big like interleaving web of different routes. And, you know, you can probably see like bigger, like huge one week routes you could do by like linking together different terrain. Um, the Alpine Lakes Wilderness is so cool to me because it's it's beautiful the peaks are awesome there's so many great lakes there's such good cross-country terrain meaning like high above tree line you know boulder fields and granite slabs and pristine lakes 
But what's also great about it is there's a lot of access points. If you look at something like the North Cascades, typically they're like, there's only one way in, right? There's like one trail they have to hike a long ways into, or there's no roads at all. But now Plain Lakes Wilderness, we, ha we have great access, but then we also have like great adventure. Um, so it's really a, a sweet combination and it's pretty close to home. I'm gonna talk a little bit now about like my philosophy on planning routes, planning adventures, finding partners and all that kind of stuff. So I see a lot of times on like Facebook forums, people are like, hey, I'm looking for a partner to do X. I'm looking for a partner to like do this route. And well, that's like definitely one way about of going about things. I kind of like, I encourage people to like invert that. So like put it on its head. Instead of starting with like what, start with why. Why are you wanting to do something? Like what motivates you? Who are you? What kind of experiences inspire you? So I really identify with people who ask the question of like why first, then maybe how, and then you actually get to what. And I think if people like kind of apply that process, um, reflecting on things, being intentional, I think that ultimately like long-term can lead to a more like fulfilling experience. Now, it depends on the person. Some people, um, you know, are more like objective focused, but I personally find like a deeper satisfaction in really thinking about what motivates me and what inspires me. And that comes down to why. So next thing I'm gonna say is find partners that understand your why. Um, I think that sometimes people might align on a, an objective, but they don't have a good time together. And that's because one person is motivated by like speed and by that feeling of moving fast and like being really technical. And the other person's why is like, I just wanna be out and like soak it in and see those beautiful ways. Like those people are not, they may like wanna do the same objective, but they're not gonna wanna do it how in the same way. And they're definitely not gonna share the same why. So even if like your talent levels, your ability levels might be a little mismatch, if you find someone that's like really motivated by the same why, I think that you'll have a better time. You'll probably find trips you want to go on together and ultimately you'll probably grow together more. I think it's important to start small. So if you want to, for example, get into high routes, you know, and but you've never done any off trail travel. Maybe it's good to start with a small high route, like the P3 to Defiance Loop on the I-90 corridor or the Malakwa Pass Loop. You know, don't just jump in the deep end um, and do something that's super committing or more dangerous. I think it's also important to like break apart skills and focus on learning one skill at a time. Something like the Alpine Lakes Press Traverse puts together so many skills. You have to be proficient on steep snow. You have to be really good at route finding, like reading a map, seeing the terrain and figuring out where to go. You got to be good at scrambling and scrambling through, you know, where there's no cairns, where it's like less predictable. You have to be fit. You know, there's like so many pieces putting it together. You have to know how to backpack with like lightweight gear. So I think it's helpful to like focus on learning one skill at a time. Maybe you go out on a trip where just your focus is route finding. Like we're gonna do a route with like a map and a compass and like, you know, talking with your group, like looking at a terrain, how you can get through this terrain well. Maybe you'll do a trip that's focusing on scrambling or snow travel or glacier travel. And by learning just like one skill at a time, it becomes a lot easier to manage, a lot safer um, than trying, than having multiple things like thrown at you at the same time. You also probably will have less error on your estimates for like how long something's gonna take. So I definitely advocate like advocate building. If you have like this goal, you know, maybe like think, work months backwards and think about like, how can I learn the skills? How can I ensure that I'm like prepared for that, for that goal? Last thing I'm gonna say is that it's also just important to really have patience with the mountains and yourself. Some of these routes that I've done, I've waited years for the right day. I've thought about the conditions I need, um, to make travel both efficient and safe to necessarily accomplish it. I think a lot of people just get like, oh, I need to finish this thing this season. They don't realize that like the people that have done it before might have waited many, many years to be ready. And the mountains don't care if it's like on your tick list to do something that season. Maybe it's just, it's not the right season for it. There's probably something else 
that is right and that is fun. Um, and also just have patience with yourself. You know, it, it can be easy to think, that's what I want to do. I got to do it this year. But for me, like these trips have been like 10 years of growth. You know, I spent my I spent early, many years just, you know, like scrambling peaks nearby, hiking stuff, you know, climbing Mount Rainier, learning glacier travel. Like you definitely want to take take steps up. And now I look back and I'm like amazed by the progress that I've made. Like I don't feel it day to day. But then when I do the same thing that I did six or seven years ago, I'm like, wow, so much easier now, so much less stressful. So it's cool to like see that growth, but you have to realize that um, mountaineering and mountain sports in general, there's just so much accumulated knowledge and such a such a like a um, feedback poor sport. You know, you can make mistakes all the time and you get lucky, but then you make one mistake and that time you don't get lucky. So it's important to really, um, really like reflect on things and and be patient. So you guys might be like wondering hey where can i find out more about these different like cool high routes and traverses since this is your thing so i have a blog with washington high routes and traverses and i i posted this a few years ago originally but i try to keep it updated maybe once or twice a season adding new routes to it so it's broken down by different geographic region uh the colors indicate different types of things like high route a technical traverse, a ski traverse, a peak link up. So here's an example, a few examples of different Alpine Lakes wilderness stuff. I encourage you to check this out. There's, I don't know, probably a hundred routes in Washington and a few out of Washington out there. So uh, tons of adventure. Some of them are my trip reports. Some of them are other trip reports. Also want to make a plug for the Cascade Backcountry Alliance. Um, for the last like eight or nine months, I've been leading the nonprofit, the Cascade Backcountry Alliance. Uh, which is a group their mission is to predict uh, protect and improve access for winter backcountry users in the pacific northwest it's just like a new grassroots um nonprofit that's working on things such as working with mount rainier about the proposed timed entry reservations i just submitted a comment letter last week kind of suggesting how they could reform their climbing permit system to help um, help the community help make it more accessible for people um, we're also we've submitted some snow park applications for new winter access points for next winter. So I encourage you to subscribe to um, our email newsletter, uh, visit our website and just keep supporting us as we grow. And that's all, you know, you can find me at climberkyle.com. Here's my email. Um, thanks again, everyone, for coming. It's awesome that I get to share these experiences. With you. I want to say thanks so much, Kyle. Um, we'll get started with the Q and A. Um, I'll help moderate if you want, but That's fine. you can also moderate I can just yourself. Help you. Yeah. Okay, okay. Cool. Sweet. Love it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's the the woven skis, which is like my friend Peter Butler has been making them for the last few years, and. I mean, I broke a lot of skis. He's broken a lot of skis, you know, just kind of like testing and working on them. But it's been cool to be a part of that process. Um, you know, they're like skis made from like wood on the Olympic Peninsula and stuff. I think currently he's kind of reconsidering if he wants to keep pursuing a career of full-time ski making. This year, it was cool to see his skis in Evo. They were in Goat Spirit and Mizama, but I don't think long-term he sees like really a future in it. So I don't think he's currently making them right now. But he was making them over in a shop in Fall City. Redmond, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Keeping up and uh, yeah, I, I'm also yeah, I can just notice it take my attention away from uh, whatever I'm doing in the moment. Before yeah. So how have you come on that part? Yeah. Uh, so early on, I didn't really. I mean, I was like taking cell phone pictures a lot. And this was back when cell phones were not very good or like an old like point and shoot. It really changed. I got like the Sony A6000 in like 2016, I think, or 2017. I forget which year. 
Uh, and at that point, I, you know, I still didn't know about it, much about it. It was just the, the kit lens. I feel like just going through the process of taking pictures and going home and like looking at them and downloading, see which ones I want to keep, just kind of naturally like started to see like framings that I like and what stuff my eyes drawn to. Maybe I consume enough photography from other people that I start to pick up on how to frame stuff, things that I like. Um, definitely, I I got it, once I got like um, an 18 to 135 millimeter zoom lens that really started to change things because the kit lens has very little zoom and it's kind of limited like the type of things you can capture with more zoom you can like really like see like a distant layer of peaks and like that catches your eye and like I think I like I strive with my photography to really like capture the feeling like capture the essence of a moment and sometimes that's like a specific thing sometimes that's like the grandness of the scenery um I, I worry less about like the most like objectively perfectly framed or perfectly lighted thing. And I'm still just shooting on like auto mode most of the time. I do use um, Lightroom after the fact. I started using that a few years ago. Definitely makes your photos nicer. As far as like taking a lot of photos like in the field, I do that a lot. And my partners luckily are pretty patient with me because sometimes I'm like, oh, can you wait right there? Like this is a really cool spot, you know? And, and they, they know that. Um, and they appreciate they appreciate the photography. I appreciate that they're patient with me. I think having the camera accessible is the biggest thing you can do. Um, if you have to take your pack off every time, you gotta take a photo. You, it's you, like you're not motivated, you know. And sometimes it's those moments that were, you weren't expecting that those are the most favorite to me. Like if you're like, I don't know, like a summit photo, you know it's gonna be awesome, right? But it's like that moment, like climbing up a ridge and you look back and your partner's like they just look like the, the, you know, like the earth drops off beneath them. Like those are like the really cool moments where a cloud passes, you know? So when I'm doing like a trail run or like a faster paced adventure, I keep my uh, Sony a6000 in kind of like near the water bottle holders. Um, the Solomon Advanced Skin 12 pack, that's a really good running vest for fitting. I can fit my Sony a6000 with the kit lens. So I can be literally like hiking, like don't even stop, pull out the camera and take it. Um, for like ski trips or backpacking trips, I use like the Peak Designs camera clip, and that's like really easy to then just like pull out and take it. Um, yeah, getting a mirrorless camera, super light, definitely like worth the investment. They're not actually, they're actually like cheaper than like DSLRs too and stuff. Well, at least the low end, I've never gotten like a nicer mirrorless camera. Yeah, does that answer the questions? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Do you have any plans to move the first while? Well, I, I I do. Um, so this year I wrote a critical art review about the art of Solius. So Solius, if you don't know, is a kind of Strava sensation around here. He does, um, for example, he dragged a tire all the way from his house in North Seattle to Mount Sai, carried it up to the top of Mount Sai and dragged it back over like three days. He does stuff like that. Uh, and it's super, super interesting. I mean, I think he's the most fascinating person. Like, I say that like tongue in cheek, like, like this art review I wrote is like half joking, but also kind of half serious that like, I think he really exposes like kind of the ridiculousness of all the activities we do, like mountaineering rides, like inherently purposeless. And he just like takes it to the extreme, almost to the point that like, we're like, this dude's crazy, but wait, we're also crazy, you know? And so I think it's actually really cool what he does. And I think he's, I, I don't personally know if he's just like oblivious or I think he's actually like a creative, like performance art genius. <laughs> and, um, you know, like the Mount Sai thing with the tire, he like took a picture of like the tire he was dragging next to an old, like, like wagon wheel, which like historically, you know, you think about like how wheels have changed human civilization um it's like interesting commentary and all so yeah i love solis beyond like the stuff in the lead of the day are you interested to see how like what's the balance between the amount of stuff you want to take like like this fast and fast or safe versus what is your i take pretty warm clothing um you know like in the winter i'll carry a a warm enough puffy definitely to be stationary all night 
and like extra layers for my legs. Uh, generally, you know, you have a shovel for avalanche gear so you could dig a cave or something if needed. I think that, you know, it's really key to carry emergency communication. So I carry the in in mini uh, Garmin inReach, you know, all the time. Um, and I don't know, like I carry a bigger ski repair kit now. Like, <laughs> you know, I carry like epoxy and, and other like clamps and other stuff. <laughs> yeah, but I think that, uh, I think that the elements are like, beyond like a first aid kit, the elements are what kill most people when they get hurt and they get in accidents. So it's really like having like water and water protection and warmth protection to be able to spend a night out if you need to. Yeah. Real. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for the boat thing, I definitely have dreamed up routes where I'm like, ah, oh, I wish like I wish there was like a, you know, minimal, like a very lightweight system and something I could carry to like get across Ross Lake or get across like Lake Chelan and stuff. I just don't know a lot about it. Um, I do have friends that do more like, say, pack rafting in like Alaska or other places. Pack rafting is not very useful in most of our rivers. Um, I definitely think it opens opens up more. It'd be interesting. I just don't know much about it. With paragliding, I do have some friends that like paraglide off of Shuxton and paraglide off, off, you know, paraglide ski off of things. And it certainly is enticing, but I also know it's like a very risky activity. It costs at least five thousand dollars to get all the training and the gear. Um, it's it, it's like I'm conflicted whether you know. I would be even if you just look at the statistics, it's definitely like more dangerous than rock climbing or skiing or like anything else like that. And, you know, taking that risk and making that part of my life is is interesting because I know that um, if I got into it, I'd probably get really into it. Like almost everyone gets addicted to it. Like you just like talk to people who like get into paragliding and they give up everything else. They just only paraglide. Here's what happens. Um, one follow up on your. Um planning for an emergency overnight. Now you actually gotten caught where you did spend the night overnight out in the wild. No, I never have. Um, the worst injuries that have happened, like my partner broke her foot high in the Grand Teton, but we, I mean, we had a camp down and she was able to get down to camp. Uh, otherwise, I feel pretty fortunate. I haven't had things majorly go wrong uh in that i've had to like spend a night out um i feel like with my trip planning i'm pretty conservative with my time estimates and i often i usually end up beating my time estimates and i think that's a good place to be uh as i said start small you know bring do something as an overnight trip if you're not sure if you're going to be able to do it or start earlier i always bring like two headlamps if i think there's any chance of being in the dark um, you know, it's those kind of little things that they're, they're very small weight penalties, but like can help put you in a place so that you're not like caught out overnight. I generally use CalTopo for all my backcountry planning. I haven't really tried like Gaia or other stuff that much. Um, bad maps and all because CalTopo can it's not the most performant it's not the best software but for backcountry planning tools I find it can do basically everything that I want and the app is decent enough for in-field navigation so I just I'm very familiar with the tools that's what I'd say Yeah. 
I think you can break down the components of that of those challenges. So Rainier is a big step up in many ways. Um, it's you know greater crevasse hazard, steeper skiing. It's more gain day. It's a higher elevation. But if you like take apart each of those individually, you can ask the question like, do I feel like I have the glacial skills? Do I have the fitness to do that much gain? Do I have the downhill skiing skills to ski 40 degree icy no fall terrain? Um, and that's how I like approach things. And if there's something you're uncertain about, you can probably find a different objective that maybe ups the ante in one of the dimensions, but not the others, you know? So like Baker definitely ups the ante in terms of, uh, it's a little more serious, you know, you're on, you're on glacier train, but it's like generally the glaciers are quite filled in in the spring or um, it's a higher elevation than St. Helens. You can go see how you do it at high elevation before you go on to like a more, you know, consequential manner. I think Adams is a great one to see how you do at elevation, but not be in like, get as deadly terrain as Rainier, for example, you know, so there's, there's like a way to like test out different things. And with steam steep terrain, I, I'd really say you can find small steep terrain. It doesn't really matter if it's a 100 foot slope, 50 foot slope, or it's a 2000 foot slope skiing 40 degrees, 40 degrees, you know, so figuring out how to how you react and how you can deal with that kind of like steeper terrain. You know? So, or maybe also if you like have been going out with partners that like see your ability on St. Helens and they've done Baker, you know, ask them about your honest, their honest opinion of like how, you know, you seem from a, you know, technical perspective or whatever. Yeah. Uh, in the back there. Yeah, a question for you. We're thinking about doing the Baker into the summer. I mean, this like question is how do you pay the level of for it? And then be like, what kind of parts of preparation are you wondering about? Well, so the confusion is like in this thing, like, I guess. North Fork of what? Oh, okay. Yeah. Like, Does that go up the Elwha Snowfinger? Yeah. It goes over Low Divide and then up the Elwha. Yeah, okay. Yeah, like yep. Yeah, okay. But like, yeah, I guess. Like, Well, you take all those unknowns and you try to like systematically remove them um, by I, I research the hell out of my trips, especially the, the bigger ones I'm concerned about. Um, anytime you have an uncertainty, there's with today's modern technology, if you want to, you can try to mitigate that uncertainty um, by reading about trip reports, looking at satellite imagery, um, you know, finding other people's routes. Uh, th there's plenty of information out there and it's important to make sure you have that information accessible when you're on the trip. Um, also like preparation wise, I think it's I think it's good to think about other uncertainties, uh, anything that could go wrong and really stack the odds in your favor. For example, think about you could make mistakes of like route finding navigation, you could have an injury, you could have a gear malfunction, you could have bad weather. Some of those things are in your control. Meaning with weather, you know, I try to do these big routes generally only when I have a bomber weather window, because I'm just like, if I'm putting this much effort into the experience, I don't want weather to be something that could derail my trip. You know, with gear, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna start with a like almost brand new pair of shoes if it's like a big high route. Because I've seen trips where people choose diesel and it ruins your trip, you know? It's like, that's something that's in your control. And with route finding, it's like, you can do as much research as you can or download, you know, satellite layers and, and like map out alternatives. You can map out ways that maybe you can take a trail here and like cut out four hours in case you fall behind, like have contingency plans, you know? So there's all these kind of like, you look at all these different potential problems and then you find out like risk mitigation, you find out like different um, alternatives and stuff. So for the Baileys, you know, you don't really have ways to shorten the route. Like is, is it is a pretty committing route. Um, but I think that the Baileys is like one of my top five trips all time. It's just incredibly beautiful and remote feeling and a totally like different characteristic, like aesthetic quality than anything you get 
and a cascade. So Bailey's are going to be awesome. Yep. You talked about like losing kind of fifteen pounds, big external sport benefit. How do you now go about the nutrition and kind of like? I try to stick to stuff I'm really, really know well. Um, I don't try anything new out on long days in the mountains, like shorter training runs are for where you do that. Um, I generally stick to pretty calorically dense food like nuts, chocolate, dehydrated food, peanut butter. Um, and I, it's not the kind of food I would eat regularly because it's kind of bland, but I know it works for me. Um, I try to eat a lot before, like in the days leading up, because on some of these like long five, six day high routes where you have to carry all your food and you're not resupplying, it's pretty hard not to run a calorie deficit and you're probably going to be hungry at the end. Um, and I've just kind of learned like what my body can take at a sustainable level. Um, I think it's also like, you know, important to like how you stack your days. Like for me, I can do like bigger days earlier in the trip easier because then definitely like that fatigue catches up um don't overlook electrolytes that can really you can get depleted over like multiple days really badly and that's actually the problem i think we'll do one more question and then we, we have time to socialize you can come uh harass him one-on-one -on -one. we'll take one more so okay last question yeah Great wrap up. Well, so one that I like to follow is one of my also one of my high school friends, Sherlyn Eliza. Uh, she's like, like Alpine Wanderlust. You might have seen her. Um, she's really, really good storyteller. And I think if you're looking for kind of she has a wider variety of different like trips and she has great like progression guides. She, she wrote like a scramble progression guide from like something like mount Sai all the way up to like a fifth class climb you know and she like lists out these like different tiers so it's like she has really good guides that are helpful and i think that like our um content kind of complement each other she's also a great photographer so that's one i like um stefa beg was like a big inspiration growing up i think we're very different in our styles and it's kind of interesting that i have ended up good friends with her sister who's very different jenny beg uh but you know just like steph introduced me to like so many different places um jason hummel was one of my original inspirations beautiful photography beautiful storyteller and i think that the storytelling aspect of my blog really was inspired by him i think he's leans more on in the spectrum you have jason hummel and you have steph at bag right they're like opposite ends. steph is like beta 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 like very like mathematical jason's like you know telling stories and flowery prose and i try to be kind of like in the middle and then one last blog who's really inspired me is Dr. Dirtbag. Um, and I've also had the good fortune of getting to know him the last year, climbed with him in the Alps and climbed ski with him in the Sierra recently. And he really blew my mind of like what was possible in a day. I just, I mean, he's like, if you haven't seen it, like his complete Northern Pickets Traverse car to car in 26 hours. Like he's done stuff that like never will be repeated. Uh, and it's just really inspiring to, hear how like down to earth he is and he's a really nice guy but then he also has such an incredible lifetime of, of, of adventure so dr drip is awesome cool thanks so much um like i said yeah let's get around the clock Yeah, thanks everyone for coming out. Like I said, we have time to socialize. Uh, I believe you should get the normal Mountaineer survey after this. And I would ask, I haven't asked this question specifically in the survey, but um, let me know what other speakers you would like to have come to our next beta and brews. Um, I'm thinking it'll be late September, October ish. So if you have a Rocktober climb or climber in mind, please let me know. I would love to hear that. Um, please do hang out, grab a beer, grab another beer, um, ask Kyle questions, meet your neighbors, find a partner, um, and get out on one of these traverses.
Thank you. 